Today on the Bible Reading Challenge podcast, we are going to give an overview of the book of Ezekiel. My name is Aaron Ventura, and I'm joined today by Pastor Doug Wilson. Pastor Doug, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Hi. Uh, So Ezekiel is, I believe, Calvin says in his prophecy, um, or in his commentary on Jeremiah, that he's going to leave commentating on Ezekiel to, he says, a more able interpreter. (laughs) And Ezekiel is actually the book. Calvin died. Uh, he died before he finished, so he got yeah. to chapter twenty. He was trying, but it did him. Yeah, <laughs> and which is kind of frustrating because uh, the latter chapters of Ezekiel are notoriously difficult for people to under- understand, right. and so we don't even get to really get Calvin's uh, yeah. common commentary on it. So we'll get there. Uh, but all that to say, Ezekiel is probably one of the most unfamiliar books to people probably reading through the Bible yes. uh, reading challenge. Uh, so. Give us just an overview of what is this book about. Okay, so um, one of the let me talk about for mention first how to approach the book. Yeah. Okay, and I would say it's the the book of Ezekiel is an Old Testament book of Revelation, and you should approach it the same way <laughs> with fear and trembling. <laughs> with fear and trembling, <laughs> and I, I would urge um, instead of coming to it like a complex code that you have to crack, it'd be far better to simply let it happen to you. Yeah. Right. Uh, it, so, so simply sit loose in the saddle, read through it. Uh, if you don't understand something, don't worry about it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and just as you're reading the Bible, and the, if you're part of the Bible reading challenge, you're committed to reading the Bible over and over and over. You're going to be back through Ezekiel again at some yeah. point. So um, the... the um, Book of Ezekiel, like Revelation, is visionary. Very, um, a, a very some disturbing images, some very complex images, some overwhelming uh, images. Yeah. And I would let the images and the imagery and the words um, be something you marinate in, mm-hmm. and don't expect to crack the code. Um, you know, in your first reading or second reading. Yeah. Because if you do crack the code, you are almost certainly wrong. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's going to be, um, I think this is a book that you really have to marinate in over years. Yeah. And, and because you're having to get acquainted with the thought forms of an ancient culture mm-hmm. and Ezekiel's perspective is a minority um, position within that ancient culture. Yeah. So, uh, that, that's the first thing. The second thing is Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel is a prophet in exile. He doesn't. He he conducts his um, entire ministry while an exile in Babylon. Yeah. So Jeremiah is an older contemporary. Jeremiah lived in Jerusalem and ministered in Jerusalem before Jerusalem fell to Babylon. Um, uh, Ezekiel is part of the first wave taken into ex- exile in 597 yeah. uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. So he's he's off in a foreign land. Yeah. Right? And uh, the, people, the people of Israel are there uh, in this foreign land because of their sin and corruption and detestable practices and all of these things. So that's why they're there. Um, and Ezekiel, what Ezekiel does is juxtapose a vi- uh, some pretty graphic images of their sinfulness, how tawdry they are, yeah. with um, magnificent images of the holiness of God. Mm-hmm. And by holiness, I like when you the the famous vision of Ezekiel saw the wheel yeah. way up in the, way up in the middle of the air. So uh, the the wheels within wheels. Uh, um, that's an image of holiness, not. Uh, when we think of holiness, we think of personal holiness. That is someone who's really good. Well, that's part of this. But holiness is also that which is completely other. Yeah. Right. Um, alien. Yeah. And this is a UFO that, <laughs> that shows up, right? That, that's right. This and it's a, it's a vision of the holiness, the transcendent holiness of an absolute God. Yeah. And the incomprehensibility of this God. Yeah. And he, and he. And he's holy in the sense of being good, but he's holy also in the sense of being distinct 
and incomprehensible mm-hmm. um, and not accessible. He's not a grandfatherly Zeus in the sky. Right. Yeah. If you think of Revelation as kind of like the capstone class in your Bible education, um, Ezekiel is definitely one of those like 500 level courses. Yeah. And and I think, as you said, in order to understand the imagery here, because he's playing with, he assumes you know Solomon's temple inside and out, which assumes you know the tabernacle inside, inside and out. out. So back in Exodus, when you're reading about the furniture, right. uh, it's like you should pay attention. And then right. in, in, when uh, Solomon's building the temple, pay attention because now he's going to be playing with that. And then Revelation is going to uh, kind of be a total culmination of all of those those symbols. So right. encouragement to, to make note of the furniture uh, <laughs> in, in those earlier chapters. Right. Um, uh, so I thought we just kind of walk through this this book, touch on a few of the more more challenging passages because that's that's why we have you here. Uh, so it opens with this crazy vision of God, uh, and so, so we're told what it is at the end uh, in uh, verse twenty eight. Uh, this was the appearance appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So so we've seen the glory of the Lord, but what exactly is this strange? Uh, we got animals and faces and, and as you mentioned, the wheels. Like, what, what is being described here? Um, and this is one of the places where John's interpretation of this in Revelation, but I, I would regard, uh, I said earlier that Revelation is a New Testament version of, uh, Revelation is heavily dependent upon the, the book of Ezekiel. He, yeah. draw, he draws the images from it. So the, 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 um, the beasts, the faces of the beasts that you see are um, uh, cherubim. Mm-hmm. And the cherubim, uh, as we see in the book of Revelation, now ch- cherubim, we've been sort of greatly misled by Valentine's Day, <laughs> by Valentine Day's, uh, Valentine's Day cards and medieval Renaissance right. painters. Where for uh, uh, if someone has a cherubic expression today, it's a fat little, <laughs> fat little rosy baby, cheeks. <laughs> rosy cheeks, fat little baby faces. So you're thinking these little flying babies yeah. with stubby wings and and a little bow and arrow. Yeah. Um, and somehow, <laughs> this is a divine sense of humor thing as he oversees the progress of history. Nothing more uncherub like yeah. uh, can be imagined yeah. than than that. So if you um, if you're unfamiliar with um, the the w- what a cherub is actually like, think of a winged uh, bull with a, an Assyrian king's head mm-hmm. on it, yeah. right? Or, or pro- probably if you're uh, the most the closest thing would be something like the Sphinx. Mm-hmm. It, um, the the Sphinx is not a cherub, but that that gives you an idea of the kind of thing. Yeah. So picture a bull. That has a huge set of wings on it, and then uh, a, a, a king's head with a like, ZZ top beard, <laughs> <laughs> and say that's that's a cherub. And of course, uh, you, you all probably know that I am. Uh, the letters I am are the Hebrew plural ending, mm-hmm. so it's one cherub, multiple cherubim, one seraph, multiple. Seraphim. Yeah. And uh, so this image is God appearing that these cherubim are essentially his throne. Yeah. Right. It, and it's a flying th- um, throne. Yeah. It's a, cha- a fiery chariot, basically. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but the wheels are not unidirectional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the wheel, uh, but that the image is, as I take it, is um, this is a chariot that can move in any direction direction like a queen in in a chess game yeah all right uh, this chariot can go any uh, in any direction yeah so God is enthroned upon the cherubim as the Bible uh, teaches and he appears in a way that's uh, that's calculated to uh, get Ezekiel to do what he in fact does yeah which is um, as soon as I turn the page here which is to fall on his face <laughs> um, so it says um, I fell on my face and I heard the the voice of one speaking. Yeah. So um, it 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 just tips Ezekiel over, topples him over. He's, yeah. He's undone, unstrung. Yeah. This is one of those places where to kind of lose yourself in the vision mm-hmm. is really helpful. If you can pay attention and try to like let your mind 
draw these these images. And then the crazy thing is then that spirit is put on Ezekiel. So we're right. taken all the way up and then he falls down and then it speaks, <laughs> right? This, this is God uh, speaking. One of the other things I noticed, and we may have talked about this with either the temple or the tabernacle is if you put the, um, so if the tabernacle were to be stood up, uh, it is okay. kind of like this horizontal version of what the co- the cosmos is like. Yeah. And like in verse 26, so above the firmament, over their heads was the likeness of a throne. So just like the the cherubim guard, the entrance into the holy place, right. the firmament. Now we're getting kind of the tabernacle that's on ground. Now we're getting it lifted yeah. up right. in, in, a, in a vertical form. So this is just one of those ways you guys can try to track uh, some of the images happening here. Uh, so what is the point now of God doing this, showing this vision now to Ezekiel? Why this vision to him in exile? Um, there is some... Uh, some of these things we don't know for, for certain, but Ezekiel was taken into exile. He was part of the first wave of prisoners yeah. when um, uh, Zedekiah was put on the throne by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And Jehoiakim, who was the um, young king, 18 years old, yeah. was taken off with Ezekiel. And uh, it, oh, I should mention that Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah are um, not – they're prophets, but they're not prophets in the in the Elijah strain. Mm-hmm. There's the uh, Elijah, the school of the prophets, the guys out in the wilderness yeah. who come blowing in to the John the Baptist yeah. kind. Um, these men are priests, and they're acquainted with the court. Yeah, the, the, they're they're players yeah. in in uh, the p- palace intrigues and, yeah. and whatnot, um, and knew each other. Well, at least Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel all probably knew each. Knew yeah. each other. They, yes, uh, I think it's likely. Now, Ezekiel wouldn't have known Jeremiah as a practicing prophet because he's not called to the prophetic ministry until uh, Babylon. Right. And then, and Jeremiah doesn't go to Babylon. Jeremiah yeah. is sort of kidnapped and taken off to Egypt. Yeah. Um, well, he kind of had the choice <laughs> later on whether he wanted to go, but he actually chooses to, to stay, stay with the people. Yeah. Right. So um, w- when Ezekiel is uh, commissioned as a prophet, um, it is likely that he was 30 years old yeah. at, at that time, a few years after he was taken into exile. So uh, this would be his commissioning as a prophet, but he's a priest. Yeah, it'd be yeah. his ordination as priest. Yeah, and so uh, in the law, the uh, your um, uh, a priest could serve from the age of 30 to the age of 50. Yep. Um, and if you look at the timeline of Ezekiel's uh, ministry, that uh, the last vision yeah. uh, may well have been when he was 50. Yeah. So, so um, that would be basically the uh, commissioning of a uh, priest slash prophet. Yeah. And we're going to get into this uh, maybe in, in chapter 28, the, uh, what I take as the deposing of, of the high priest. But if, um, if you are a Jew... And there's all of this apostasy, as we'll see in the temple. Mm-hmm. One of your questions, especially in exile, is, so where do we worship? How does worship work? Right. Um, where is the presence of God? And and where is the – you need a high priest also. Right. And so in a certain right. sense, Ezekiel is um, this whole symbol of God going with uh, his people into exile, but also – uh, providing a, a way to worship, like his glory is going to be with them. That, that, that's a very good point because, uh, for example, when the temple is dis- uh, well, when the temple is destroyed, um, well, I, I need to back up. Remember that Ezekiel is taken into exile as part of the first wave. The temple is not yet destroyed yeah. by the Babylonians, right. and so one of the things that Ezekiel has to deal with is his visions. Uh, his vision of the dirty deeds yeah. that, are, that are still going on yeah. back in Jerusalem, um, the, the corruptions within the temple and, right. and so on. So he, um, it's like God fires a warning shot across their bow. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's because your wickedness, your wickedness, your wickedness. And he takes the first wave, and Ezekiel is there in Babylon, mm-hmm. and he sees that the the people of Israel are still doubling down on their corruption. Yeah. Then the Babylonians come in and destroy the place, yeah. level the place, such that 
Nehemiah in Nehemiah Ezra, they have to come back and rebuild the temple. Well, th- there's a precursor, I think, in the book of Ezekiel that confronted – it's like there's two ways to go. After the second temple, Herod's temple, mm-hmm. um, was destroyed in 70 AD, um, there, were two ways to, there were two ways to go. There was the rabbinic Judaism. So the, the Jews who's, who continued to deny that Jesus was the Messiah – had to figure out a, in, they had it in effect. They had to invent a new religion, yeah. right? And that's what rabbinic Judaism is. That Judaism is a temple-based religion, yeah. and rabbinic Judaism isn't. So they they had to sort of come up with that on their own. Yeah. There is a temple-less form of Judaism mm-hmm. that is righteous which is called the Christian faith, yeah. <laughs> right? Where Christ is our temple and the Christian church is the, the temple of the Holy uh, Spirit. Yeah. Now, I think that Ezekiel is w- with the, the impending doom on the first temple, mm-hmm. on Solomon's temple that yeah. is coming down on them, and Ezekiel is ministering in exile, where we get a glorious vision mm-hmm. of that temple-less form of faith right. um, in the Christian ch- in the Christian church in his in Ezekiel's temple yeah. in the latter half of the book. Yeah. And maybe we should just uh, talk right here about this idea of the son of man. So this uh, Ezekiel is called son of man over and over again and then this is Jesus's favorite title for himself. So talk about uh, what is the meaning of that? It goes back to son of to, to the first man, but why would Jesus pick this? Ezekiel-like title for his ministry. Right. The one, uh, it's a, the Bible is full of great <laughs> questions. <laughs> the Bible provokes many great questions like that. I, I, my understanding of the Son of Man title is that Jesus was picking a title that was clearly messianic if you knew your Bible really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and the mess, the one messianic place is Daniel 7. Yeah. So um, where Daniel sees one like unto a son of man mm-hmm. coming on the clouds of heaven. Yeah. And Jesus quotes that at his, actually at his trial, he quotes that. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jesus at his trial quotes, um, you'll see the son, one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, seated at the right hand of the power. Um, and that's the slam dunk messianic use, yeah. right? Um, the, the phrase son of man in Ezekiel appears to be uh, more typologically rich. Yeah. Uh, so it's like a, um, well, he's a man. Uh, he's a representative man. He is, um, uh, so for example, if I could take an, another phrase slightly different, the man of God mm-hmm. it, throughout the Old Testament is a prophet. Yeah. Um, and so when, in Paul, when Paul says, when the man of God may be complete uh, for every good work, He's talking about a minister mm-hmm. there, right? Yeah. So the phrase son of man is, I, I take it, as someone set apart, ordained to prophetic ministry. Yeah, Jesus picks that up. He's the prophet, priest, and king. He picks that up um, in a way that he can call himself the son of man throughout his ministry. It has a messianic um, uh, overtone mm-hmm. because of Daniel. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's the sort of thing that he can keep his identity under wraps until the resurrection. So it's it's really interesting mm-hmm. because throughout the Lord's ministry, uh, when uh, someone confesses, you know, the demons say who he is or something, and he tells them to shut up. Yeah. Or uh, when Peter confesses, uh, has this great moment. Okay, okay very good. Mm-hmm. It, it's not like he denies it. But he doesn't want it proclaimed yeah. until the resurrection. I think that's because he wants our declaration of his messiahship, his divinity, to wait until God's declaration of it. Yeah. So um, in Romans 1, 4, it says that Jesus was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Yeah. So when, um, when Jesus comes back from the dead and he is the firstborn from the dead, declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, then we are commissioned, okay, now go tell everybody. Now now it's it's no longer an open secret. It's Mm -hmm. now to be declared to the end of the world. Yeah. 
in, during the ministry of Christ, his identity, is he a son of man? Is he Elijah? Is he, is he a, a returned prophet? Who, yeah. who is he? Is um, something that Jesus was willing to for people to puzzle over for the time being. Yeah, and I'd encourage folks, as you're reading this, another question you can be asking is, uh, in what ways does Jesus do something similar to what Ezekiel's doing? So obviously the glory of the Lord is upon Christ in his, in his veiled form, mm -hmm. but he's also this one sent to, he's he's the last prophet before the destruction of of the temple, mm -hmm. and he's also going to prophesy, speak of a new temple to come. This is, these are all things that Jesus right. is, is going to embody also in his ministry. Right, exactly. Um, okay, I want to get into chapter four here and talk about some of these, I don't know, uh, enactments of judgment or these uh, kind of physical... Uh, so he's got to lay on his side for, what is it, 390 <laughs> days for Israel, 40 days for Judah. I remember reading this as a little kid and thinking like... Um, how did he live? <laughs> like, uh, like right. you know, did he get sore? Yeah. Uh, so how should we understand some of these? Um, is, this a, is this just a vision? Did this really happen? Uh, how long did he have to be out there in the, in the town square for yeah, to elements. fulfill it? Yeah. Yeah. So I take, this, uh, I take this as something he actually did. I think that this was um, prophetic street theater. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where... He was enacting uh, a prophecy, not just declaring a prophecy, but he was enacting one. Yeah. And he had everybody's attention. And he, and he didn't have everybody's attention because he was, the, you know, the homeless bum weirdo yeah. uh, down, in, down in the city center. But he was a, he was a prophet and recognized as, as such. And different societies have had um, – Today, we don't have a category for this, mm -hmm. right? Um, we would just think that a homeless guy escaped from the short, uh, from the short bus, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, but they had, a, they had categories for this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, it was an enacted prophecy, and I believe that he was, by the godly, his behavior here was respected and, okay, let's – read this message, just interpret this message. Yeah. Um, so on, on things like this, we don't know if he lived there, if he had a cot or a sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. Someone obviously had to bring him food. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. Well, he gets uh, this ex exemption for what kind of uh, dung he can use to cook, to cook his food, right? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, what are the questions? So as I was thinking through this, so he's in by the K-Bar Canal, so somewhere near Babylon, we don't know exactly where, where that is. So he's not in uh, Judah, but his messages are all aimed at uh, Israel and Judah, but he's not there. So he's uh, doing this theater in a place uh, where the, these are, a lot of them are probably faithful if they're listening to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 29, mm -hmm. build houses and stuff. So do you take him as he's doing this by the K-Bar Canal, and then he's writing it down sending it by letter back to uh, uh, Jerusalem to be read. So they're actually receiving it in like um, newspaper form rather or, than actually or this, seeing this. Or the, the, the form it finally takes in, um, in Ezekiel here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think this is very much a prophecy for the Jews who are still in Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, um, and uh, so I think, and I think it's calculated to um, resonate with them, to – to convict them of their sin, uh, he is, um, and it and it, and it might explain the outlandishness of it. Yeah, where it, uh, he needed to do something to be heard at that distance. Mm -hmm. he, you know, so people back in Jerusalem are saying he he's doing what? Yeah, you know. Can can you talk more broadly about the the prophets as preachers, but also the prophets as writers of uh, of scripture or letters, because like with Jeremiah, he's you know sending these oracles of judgment off to Egypt or off to wherever is yeah. gonna gonna fall to the point where um, like you think of Daniel, how did he survive all of the different kings? They they knew about him, or yeah. or why how they know to show Jeremiah mercy? Like they they knew about him. So um, 
talk, talk about both the the speaking, the preaching, but also the place of writing for for prophets. Yeah. So um, with someone like Jeremiah, it was easier because when they when the Babylonians captured the city, uh, Jeremiah's in custody. <laughs> so and and just like when when Ezekiel is saying, this is how this is how politics work, right? So when the Babylonians are in an adversarial relationship with Jerusalem, mm-hmm. Judea, and Jeremiah is letting the people in the city have it. Well, I don't have any doubt that the Babylonians outside the wall knew all about Jeremiah. Yeah. Right? Um, and I don't have any doubt that the Babylonians knew about Ezekiel mm-hmm. uh, because what he's prophesying is a politically – Advantageous to them. Yeah, you're a hammer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, the, now they they don't they're not signing off on what Ezekiel says because they get his message top to bo- bottom and understand it. Yeah. But it happens to be cutting with the grain that they want to cut with. Yeah. Right. So um, and not only so, but the people back in Jerusalem, the evildoers back there, mm-hmm. have to know that. Ezekiel's prophecy is adversarial to them. Right. Okay. Now, when the prophets, it, the second part of your question has to do with um, the writing of these things yeah. down. Um, over and over again, the prophets write things down as a testimony, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's so that you, in Deuteronomy 18, how, how do you tell a true prophet? Well, a true prophet is someone whose prophecies come true. Yeah. <laughs> right, they they come to pass. If they don't come to pass, you don't have to worry about that guy. Right. Um, Daniel prays because on the basis of uh, for the um, for the end of the captivity, mm-hmm. on the basis of what Jeremiah wrote down. Yeah. All right. So um, Daniel's an old man by by this time, but regeneration doesn't make your memory perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Uh, it's important to write these things down. It's sort of like a, uh, Moses uh, writing the Song of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy. Yeah. So he he um, writes this song to put in the liturgy. Yeah. So that the people will be held accountable for the this information. It's very easy when it's not written down, or if it is written down and then lost. I think of uh, when Josiah has the uh, temple refurbished. Mm-hmm. And they find what I what I take to be the book of Deuteronomy. Mm-hmm. They find a scroll, yeah. and they and things were so far gone in Judea that they didn't know about a book of the Bible. They, yeah, they didn't know about Deuteronomy. Yeah, and so they read the book of Deuteronomy, and Josiah's response is yikes, mm-hmm. right? But but what does that tell you about um, how easy it is to lose? institutional memory. Yeah. It wasn't right? that long. It, not that long. Yeah. And so I think the prophets write it down, write these things down to keep the memory of their testimony alive. Yeah. So that when the prophecies come to pass, which sometimes they come to pass 70 years later, sometimes 400 years later, mm-hmm. uh, people will know. Yeah. It's really interesting when you think about the our doctrine of inspiration or how we even know what books are in the Bible. Ultimately, we say the Holy Spirit bears witness Mm -hmm. to the truth. And we always tend to think of that in terms of we're reading something and and it bears witness to me. You know, you read uh, the Apocrypha and you're like, this is probably Uh, some good stuff, but it doesn't have the same It's good stuff, but I'm kind of glad it's not in the Bible. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was reading, uh, I read uh, Judith recently. It was just this this great, great story. You know, she chops off the guy's head. I was telling my wife about it, but it does have like some historical you know inaccuracies yeah. to yeah. it. And you're like, oh, that's, a, that's a good story to to read your your Jewish kids, but yeah. it, it's not Bible. Um, but for them, it would have been they're hearing the word. Mm-hmm. You know, th- this word is going out. There's no canon for them to say right. th- this is it. So in that period of uh, original uh, revelation, it's the Spirit of God that they're going to have. Uh, they actually have to make a decision: is is this a true prophet? Or is this right. not? And it's just crazy to think about the uh, if you're just a your average citizen, like you would want to be faithful to God, so you would be able to know even what is. Yeah, right which and one wrong. do you which one do you listen to? The, yeah, the king calls the prophets in front of him, and 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 you've got two 
schools of thought. Yeah. yeah. Two sets of prophets prophesying. Yeah. And you have to decide. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Jumping ahead uh, to chapter 16, where which is, I think, one of the most like gut wrenching chapters in this book. So this is the uh, description of of Israel portrayed as first kind of the, this little baby that God adopts and she grows right. up and God marries her. And then she becomes this this great harlot. And it ends on a high note. But uh, so, so once upon a time, you wrote a, a, an article, a blog on why Christian women are prettier. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this. I, I, this do, I, I, I remember writing that and I remember the reaction. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so bring that kind of idea into the context of a chapter like this, this relationship between beauty and faithfulness, ugliness and idolatry. How does right. that work? Yeah. So there's the perennial, this is true of uh, not just beauty, but all of God's gifts. And it's the perennial giver and gift problem. Mm -hmm. So God, as a lover, gives gifts to his beloved. And the temptation to the beloved is to get distracted by the gift and forget the giver. Mm -hmm. That's the... Um, so uh, Cotton Mather said, faithfulness begat prosperity and the daughter devoured the mother. Mm -hmm. Or in Deuteronomy, Jeshuan waxed fat and kicked. Mm -hmm. um, in Deuteronomy 8, it talks about how all God's going to bless them with all this wealth, all these good things. And then you look and say, it's my hand that has gotten me this wealth. Yeah. Or Nebuchadnezzar looks down at the city of Babylon and says, is this not great Babylon that I've built? Yeah. So... Um, Pride goes before destruction, mm -hmm. haughty spirit before the fall. And Paul Paul aims at this when he says, what do you have that you did not receive as a gift? And if as a gift, why do you boast as though we're not? Mm -hmm. why, why do you take pride in your gifts? Yeah. Okay, well, there's, there's no more um, uh, obvious avenue for the devil to tempt you to be proud of a gift that you have have mm -hmm. uh, than, than the gift of beauty, mm -hmm. okay? Because it's so closely connected to your identity. identity. Yeah. It's, it's your face. Yeah. Now, if, you know, let's say I lived for 40 years and then all of a sudden a rich uncle that I didn't know existed died and left me $10 million, it's really easy for me to recognize I didn't earn this. Mm -hmm. It's that $10 million is not part of my identity. And, right. you know. But if you have someone who's beautiful, the favored child, the, you know, um, and they've been had people telling them they're adorable since they were two. Yeah. And they grow up that way. It's really, really easy to think that this is my birthright. Mm -hmm. This is just who I am. Yeah. I'm just, I've got it together. Yeah. Um, and Ezekiel is very, um, pungent in his description of, uh, I found you wallowing in your blood. I found yeah. you, you were. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, remember where uh, you came from. You were a waif. Yeah. You, you were uh, found in a cardboard box outside the orphanage. Yeah. That, that's where you came from. Yeah. And I took you and brought you up and raised you. But still, that perennial temptation yeah. of taking credit for things God gave you. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, and probably the toughest things are, are looks and smarts, mm -hmm. probably. Um, people who have intellectual gifts are tempted to think, well, this is just the way I am. Yeah. Uh, people who have— You get you get in the class when you're in, like, kindergarten. The, there's the gifted class, yeah. right? <laughs> what, oh, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, um, so basically, um, Ezekiel paints a picture of a really grimy beginning— mm -hmm. And, and he emphasizes the giving nature of this uh, woman's husband mm -hmm. and how she was then distracted by her own beauty, considering it her own birthright, considering it her own identity, yeah. and then thought she was responsible and uh, therefore she was responsible for finding her own lovers. Yeah. So I want to see if we can – uh, make some more applications from this this chapter. So, some would look at this and say, "Okay, 
this is why we can't have nice things, us <laughs> people. Um, you know, I've been, uh, you know, you walk through the Vatican and it's this ridiculous, enormously way too big yeah. church <laughs> building. And, and it's no wonder they are, you know, they're yeah. proud, right? right? So, um, but, but we know it's not the stuff. It's, it's us. That's the problem. So some would, would want to say, you know, well, I should like make myself ugly, you know, right. in order to to keep my right. put some some guards in place. And I think about also what, what we're doing here. We're trying to you know build build a church building, having right. met in a gymnasium. So how do you think about applying something like this? Remember where you came from, so that when we maybe go into this this uh, grand building, mm-hmm. we hope it is that we don't be like, oh, this is how it always was, because there's going to be kids who grow up. In that church. In that church. That's right. And it's going to be normal to them. Yeah. Just like a gym is normal to the kids who grew up in that church. Yeah. Right? Um, your comment about the Vatican reminded me of the story. I think it's of Thomas Aquinas who was being shown around uh, and the Pope said, See, Thomas, uh, no longer can the church say silver and gold have I not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and Thomas Aquinas said yes, but neither can she say rise up and walk. Yeah, right. So there's a trade. There's a yeah. a trade off. Um, so when um, the the problem is the prideful heart of man is, if I may speak this way, is a sneaky bastard, <laughs> and because um, the Apostle Paul pinpoints this problem when he uh, in First Corinthians thirteen. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am nothing. Mm-hmm. If I give my body to be burned and have not love, I am nothing. Mm-hmm. If I give everything I have to the poor. All right? In other words, if you went through and uh, gave everything away that the Vatican has, and right. gave it all away to the poor, yeah. and went and lived in, a, in, in an abandoned bathtub, yeah. um, you could be proud of that. Yeah. Right? right? So um, the, the problem with human pride can only be dealt with through Christ and the cross. Mm-hmm. It's the only solution to it is gospel. Yeah. It's not rearranging the furniture. Yeah. You can't get in with God by accumulating f- furniture and you can't get in with God by giving it all away. Yeah. It is it's got to be gospel preaching that sort of aims at the heart of the beast. Mm-hmm. And the heart of the beast is me me me. Look at me accumulate wealth, yeah. or look at me give all this wealth away. Right, right. It's um, it's egocentric, both ways. Yeah. So there have been some proud and haughty popes. There have also been some proud and haughty brethren in clapboard chapels who would never dream of being right. like one of those popes. Yeah. Uh, sh- shifting gears now, I want to uh, chase down uh, what sometimes gets used as a text against. Calvinist. So this is in Ezekiel 18. I'm looking at verses uh, kind of 19 to 20, but it is this whole section. Uh, and, and so I'm just going to read this real quick. It says, sure. yet you say, uh, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and observe them. He shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So sometimes this gets used to argue against uh, federal uh, covenant, uh, yeah, thinking. covenant thinking or the imputation of Adam's sin uh, to us. So how would you respond to someone using this text that way? Yeah, I'd say you're, you're taking it out of the um, realm in which Ezekiel is applying it. So there, um, we ought not to say, we're going to shoot you because your great grandfather was a murderer, we're going to execute you. Right. Um, because the law, the law of God forbade that kind of. You, uh, when Ezekiel is appealing to this principle, yeah, um, it's a principle that comes from the Torah. Yeah. Okay. So it's not it's not something new that Ezekiel cooks up. But what the Torah was forbidding was the um, uh, execution of the extended family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or family members because of the crime of the father. Also, incidentally, this is why I take the execution of an entire family like Aiken's family yeah. as um, 
uh, evidence that they were complicit in the crime itself. Okay. So uh, that's your so the law is your controlling hermeneutic for the, how you interpret what these happens. These other passages. Okay. So um, and when uh, at Korah's rebellion, when the the people in the wilderness are swallowed up by the that was the Lord's judgment. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the, all the families fell, fell alive in Sheol, it, it says. And then when uh, uh, David, um, when the, the Gibeonites say, when, when David has the, some uh, sons of Saul, um, descendants of Saul mm-hmm. executed because of um, the treatment of the Gibeonites, uh, I, I would take that as their, including their complicity in it. Okay. I don't think that uh, because the law absolutely forbade uh, Grandpa being a criminal, and he robbed the bank, and that yeah. and that you are ex- you you are uh, punished for it. And I think that that's what Ezekiel is talking about here. Um, if someone says, "Well, see, nobody dies for the sin of their father," and I say, "Okay, why do you die then?" Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Everybody, or why does a baby die? Why does a baby die? Why yeah. why does any why is there death in the world? Yeah. Well, clearly there is a federal covenantal responsibility mm-hmm. for the uh, the original rebellion in the garden yeah. that we were all complicit in. Mm-hmm. Our father Adam represented us in that action and that's why we die. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's not appropriate for me to be held to account for something my great grandfather did mm-hmm. um, as an individual crime, yeah. because he was not my representative mm-hmm. in that. So w- when uh, when it says that God visits the iniquity onto the, the third and fourth third generation, and fourth generation well, w- what does he mean by that then? So actually, I think that that's a um, a um, um, a mercy. So because in in Deuteronomy five and Exodus. 20, where the, the, that's in the Ten Commandments, it says, he visits iniquity to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, mm-hmm. um, but shows mercy to thousands. Well, thousands of what? Thousands of generations. Yeah. So in Deuteronomy 7, it, the word generations is not used there, but in Deuteronomy 7, it is. Mm-hmm. And God shows mercy to thousands of generations. So what he's doing is... Uh, growing up in the home of an alcoholic or go- growing up in the home of a Molech worshiper mm-hmm. is no picnic. Yeah. Right. And so God limits the damage that is going to be done by that idolater mm-hmm. to uh, three and four generations. So it's God's mercy mm-hmm. that, uh, that where he limits it, he bounds it. Yeah. But he show- his, his, uh, his uh, tender mercy is overflowing to a thousand generations yeah. of those who worship him. So, so would he be describing, uh, so you mentioned kind of like the alcoholic situation. So would he be describing just what happens apart from God's intervening grace if a child grows up in a home mm. that hates God, they're mm. going to just be taught to hate God and, right. and so on? That's right. Okay. The, the, they, they are already complicit in Adam's sin, the children are, yeah. but... Um, they are given a much steeper uphill climb. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, having a godly upbringing is an immeasurable gift. Yeah. And if someone doesn't have that, God, in his mercy, limits it to three and four generations. Yeah. Uh, okay, moving into uh, chapter 28. And uh, so this is a chapter, I think, growing up, I grew up in kind of like dispensational circles. And I think this was one of those passages that a lot of people would point to as the fall of Satan. Mm-hmm. And there's there's some cool stuff about walking amongst, you know, stones of fire and, and whatnot. So uh, there's a few different interpretive options here. Um, yeah. I'm curious to know what yours is, and maybe we, and we'll see if we have the same one or different ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I take, um, we have to piece a number of things uh, together. Yeah. So, um, and so it'd be wise not to be dogmatic about any of them. Right. But this is uh, this is my take. I my understanding is that the devil or Satan is a fallen seraph. Okay. Okay. Now not not a cherub, and that excludes him from uh, this because okay. uh, it says he was in the you were a, you were an anointed guardian cherub. I yep. placed you. Right. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire. You walked. Um, so I think that this is talking about one of the fallen celestials. Mm-hmm. 
I do think it's talking about one of the um, – my understanding is that in Revelation, uh, the dragon pulls down a third of the stars uh, with his tail. And I, th- I think the rebellion of Satan and his minions mm-hmm. involved a third of the host of heaven. Okay. So there were a number of other uh, entities yeah. with, with Satan. And you get a good picture of this, at li- this part of it, at least from Milton's Paradise Lost, right. where you've got all these great you know, um, uh, demonic uh, forces that were yeah. formal, formally celestial. So in, in 1 John... We're told that the devil was a murderer from the beginning. Mm-hmm. We're told that the devil – so I believe the devil was clearly the one in the garden. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a serpent that tempts them. Yeah. And Is that where you get your seraph? So, so like, yeah, what text would you point to to say he's not a cherub, he's a, he's a, he's a, a burning seraph. one or a so, seraphim? Um, so when uh, – in John, in John, the bronze serpent is lifted up in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. And – when you that's hearkening back to the incident in numbers yeah. where the people were being bitten by snakes by by these flying yeah. serpents Ter- i take them as pterodactyls <laughs> <laughs> well they're venomous yeah. they're, they're also venomous <laughs> so they're being bitten by these things and they're they're flying serpents herodotus talks about small versions of them mm-hmm. so it's not necessarily dinosaur like or yeah. huge dragon things but uh, herodotus talks about these venomous um, Creatures and uh, the ancient Jews thought of them the same way. And in Numbers, there was a bronze figure of one of them sort of impaled on a stake. Mm -hmm. And everyone who looked on that impaled serpent was uh, healed of his snake bite. And uh, in Numbers, the word that is used for that serpent is seraph. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, seraph means shining one or burning one, yeah. but that that um, phrase is used in numbers. So it's a, and then Jesus identifies himself with that, like he's going to be lifted up the way yeah. uh, the uh, the ser- this seraph was lifted up in numbers, and then the serpent is the one that tempts them in the Garden of Eden, mm-hmm. and then uh, in Romans Paul says the God of peace will soon crush Satan beneath your feet. Mm-hmm. So I identify Satan with that original serpent. Okay. Either he was the serpent or he possessed the serpent. Okay. But he's identified in some way with this uh, with this worm or this right. serpent. So that's um, so that's why I think the devil was there from the beginning. Here this cherub uh, was a, a guardian cherub uh, connected with Eden mm-hmm. in verse um, uh, 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God, yeah. every precious stone. Now, in the Old Testament, you have the powers of the the earthly powers, the princes, the kings. Mm-hmm. This is the king of Tyre yeah. here. Um, and all through the Old Testament, there were gods or celestial beings behind the, th- the throne. Yeah. Uh, so I think Michael, the archangel, was the entity behind Israel. Right. Um, uh, the, the Beelzebub was the god of Ekron, mm-hmm. of the Philistines. Uh, and that name later becomes Beelzebub. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is a, a fallen celestial being that was the power behind the throne for Tyre. Okay. But I don't think, I don't take it as the, as the arch fiend, the yeah. devil. Okay, so uh, two of the other options interpreting that, so some would take it as like Adam, who is... Um, He's kind of he's supposed to guard and keep the garden, yes. right? So, mm-hmm. so the, he has kind of a cherubic like function because the cherubim are placed there once he's right. kicked out. And then what, one of the things I found persuasive is uh, so I don't uh, he does make this distinction possibly between the prince of Tyre at uh, in the first kind of section of twenty eight and then the king of Tyre. So those are two those could be two different people mm-hmm. or they could be the, the same. same. The right. the thing that I thought was interesting. Um, where it takes it as the high priest would be, um, so the high priest is this person in in the temple in the garden of God, and then every precious stone was your covering, and then he goes through all the stones that were would be on the high priest's yeah. breastplate. Yeah. You were anointed. Um, you're on the holy mountain of God. This is all imagery of being inside the temple. Yeah. Well, so um, in support of that, the remind the listeners that. 
the tabernacle uh, is an artificial mountain. Right. Right. It's a it's a trysting place. Yeah. Of where, um, and so you could if if you take um, this uh, vision or this statement symbolically, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's a plausible argument. Yeah. The other thing we'd want to go back to and say, who was the original king of Tyre? And this would be Hiram, who supplies the materials for, for, the, temple. for the temple. So what, one of the reasons I take that is because I think it uh, it does get connected possibly to the, the vision at the end with the, the building of the temple, then also with Ezekiel's uh, ministry as as priest or or high priest. So uh, maybe we could we could just leave that there. Yeah, just, uh, you've you've got just, options. J- just leave that there. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, I want to. How much time do we have? Okay, we should probably just go to the, these final chapters here. Um, I know there's tons of stuff in here that I'm reading. I'm like, I have no idea what this means, what that means. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're for the listeners, we're skipping over all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. So now we're going to come to, I, I just got to read this quote from Matthew Henry because this, this is so great. So we're uh, talking about chapters 40 to 48. Uh, he says, the Jews will not allow any to read it till they are 30 years old and tell those who do read it, though they cannot understand everything in it. When Elias comes, he will explain it. <laughs> so we're still, they're, they're still waiting for Elias to come and, and explain it. But right. we have the explanation yes. uh, here. So what, what's happening here with this new temple vision? Okay, so I take this temple vision as being um, Ezekiel's version of what John is pointing to with the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven um, uh, from God. Okay. And some of the, and, and John sort of makes it, I think, um, evident mm-hmm. by some of the images he uses, the, the, the trees that grow on both sides of the river yeah. and the, the leaves were for the healing, healing of the nations and, and so on. Um, the, one of the things that is, uh, really interesting to to me and i think it's it's a, a key to understanding this section the um the new jerusalem in revelation i believe is an image of the christian church okay uh the angel says come i will show you the bride the wife of the lamb yeah and he took me to a high mountain and showed me the new jerusalem so the bride the wife of the lamb is the christian yeah. church and so if if the New Jerusalem is the Christian church and the New Jerusalem is the New Testament version of Ezekiel's temple, mm-hmm. then Ezekiel's temple is the Christian church. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and so what would be some of the reasons for for saying that? Yeah. I'll give a, 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 a sort of a, a plain, straightforward one and then one that's kind of in the weeds but, okay. but fun. Um, Ezekiel's temple has – water flowing out of over the threshold. Yeah. So there's this temple structure and there's water that's living water, water that brings life. Mm-hmm. Um, flows over the threshold and when it gets over the threshold it's a damp spot on the pavement and mm-hmm. you go further and further out. The farther out you get from the temple the deeper it gets. Yeah. It's ankle deep and then knee deep and and then it becomes uh, the sort of thing you'd have to swim. Mm-hmm. And when you get out there with all this living water that is flows from the temple, um, it's that's where you run into the trees with leaves for the healing of the nations, yeah. the, the tree of life, basically. Uh, so this is the life giving water that flows from the temple mm-hmm. to the world. Right. Okay. Which is the a picture of the gospel. John, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, "Whoever believes in me, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water." Yeah. And I think that. All of us, Peter says that we're living stones Mm -hmm. in the temple that God is building. Yeah. And living water flows out of the living stones. Yeah. And you could almost see the the river is the bronze sea, uh, the lava of cleansing that's been poured out. So the it kind of almost has has that baptismal imagery of it's coming to flood the world. And instead of being contained in a bronze laver, yeah, it's it's like it's tipped over yeah. and and then the whole thing inundates the world, a, right. re, a redemptive or salvific flood yeah. as opposed to a flood of judgment. Yeah. The, that, that's, I think, is a pretty straightforward reading. Um, living stones, uh, what, living water flows out of living stones. The living stones together are the church. Living water flows out from the church mm-hmm. to the world and brings life to the world. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's, how, that's the um, 
overarching vision. But then there's something interesting at the end of the Gospel of John, where uh, at the restoration of Peter, mm -hmm. um, it has this um, interesting little thing that where Jesus identifies himself um, to Peter. Well, to the the men are fishing all night. They're they're fishing out on the uh, on the sea. And Jesus appears on the shore and says, um, have you caught anything? And no. And he says, tells them where to lay, let down the net. And they haul in a bunch of fish. Well, that's how Peter was first called. Mm -hmm. And in Luke, Peter falls on his knees, depart from me, I'm a sinful man yeah. because of this big haul of fish. Well, then Peter, remember, has denied the Lord. And this is um, uh, his, rest his great restoration to the apostolic ministry. And John makes an interesting point about there were 153 fish. Yeah. Why on earth? <laughs> <laughs> what, what did we? Uh, why do we need to know that? Yeah. Um, now, a modern novel writer might throw that in to just make it seem realistic, or yeah. he wrote that down. Because, <laughs> that seems like an odd number. I'll throw it in there for right. realism. Yeah, but that's not how the gospel writers functioned. Right. Right. Um, and so the, he, this is the, the fun part, and it ties in with Ezekiel. Um, uh, there are two, two words I have to introduce here. One is a triangular, and one is gematria. Okay? So a triangular is uh, 153 is uh, a triangular of the number 17. Okay? So and a triangular is if you take 17 – Add it to 16, add it to 15, add it to 14, add mm -hmm. it to 13, down to 1. Right. It adds up to 153. So uh, 153 is the triangular of 17. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, now, that's uh, one bit of free information. <laughs> <laughs> try and work it into, com try and work it into casual conversation yeah. later today. The other thing is gematria. Uh, gematria is... In English, we have Arabic numerals for math right. and Roman letters for words. Mm -hmm. But in Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin, the, their letters did double duty for numbers and for letters, yeah. which meant that they had a toggle switch in their brain. Mm -hmm. If you were a Greek speaker or a Latin speaker, they could look at a name and it flip a switch in their brain and they'd see a row of numbers. Yeah. Okay. So, And if you were good at addition, you would look at my name – Doug, yeah. D is number four. Yeah. So A, B, C, D. D is four. O yeah. is whatever it is. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Can't count that far. <laughs> uh, yeah. Doug is 371. So you would you would look at that row of numbers and add them up, and that's the number. Yeah. Okay. Now, in, um, uh, in this place uh, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 47, uh, where it's talking about living water, mm -hmm. it flows – uh, t t it floods two regions, En Gedi and and in Glyam, hmm. uh, Eglayim. Uh, and if you and the word En in Hebrew simply means spring, mm -hmm. so it's like Colorado Springs, yeah. right? So if you just took the Gedi um, and added that, used gematria, looked at Gedi, that's seventeen, and Eglayim, that's one hundred and fifty-three hmm. in Hebrew. So. Um, Man, you are doing some numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the living water flows. The living water flows, and it flows to these two places. And uh, it says in um, – where to go? It talks about – oh, the other thing is in the Old Testament, nobody eats fish. Yeah. Right. If, you, you don't know. even find fish anywhere until I think Jeremiah probably when right. he says he – ta he talks about fishing. Yeah. And Ezekiel talks about um, fishing. Um, it says in Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel uh, 47, 9, and wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea from En Gedi, mm -hmm. okay, N17, to En Eglayim, N153 will be a uh, will be a place for the spreading of nets, just like yeah. Peter and John did by the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. 
but its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the banks on both sides of the river, they'll grow all kinds of trees for food. Um, so I think that this is a fun little detail yeah. that John is tipping his hat uh, tipping his hat to. Right. And it wouldn't, if you were a speaker, if you knew how to speak Hebrew and you read Hebrew, you would be, you could read En Gedi as N17 or N Mm-hmm. And Aglaim is N-153. Yeah. And then John says, okay, we've just been commissioned to be fishers of men again. Right. Yeah. Um, and Peter has been restored to the ministry. Mm-hmm. And wink, nod. There was 153 fish there. Yeah. That's 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 a very fun that's that's a fun one. Yeah. Uh, you, you have too much time on your hands, I think. Yeah. You're not you're not yeah, very busy, are you? <laughs> uh, so so let me uh so I I agree with the view, uh, what you might call like the church view. I wonder if if you would agree with what I would call kind of like a modified church view. So so one of the problems here, so some of like the dispensationalists want to say this is going to be like really built one day and there will Mm -hmm. be sacrifice. So one of the problems is there's animal sacrifices for atonement. The dispensationalists want to say these are just memorials, but... They weren't just memorials. Uh, they were always memorials yeah, to it. Yeah. And and so you do have this description of sacrifices or redivision of land. So the way the way that I take it is it is uh, symbolical of the restoration era. So from uh, pretty much the rebuild of the temple under Ezra and Nehemiah through AD 70, but it's typological of the new heavens and new earth. So some, I would take some of these details as foretelling, for example, uh, like the reuniting of the tribes, which we've talked before happens in, in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. So it's prophesying a, uh, so the temple they're going to build could not be, they, they couldn't build this. So if you, yeah, so it, let's um, put it another way. If, uh, if someone asked, do you think that Ezekiel's prophecy in this section was irrelevant to Nehemiah and Ezra? I'd say no. Right. No. It's uh, it's all the word of God. It's relevant to them. Yeah. But even their efforts were still looking forward to the the yeah. final and complete restoration. Yeah. That, yes. That's one of the things I was thinking about is Ezra and Nehemiah know this. Yes. And they're building something they know isn't this. So I think right. it, yeah. there's a certain sense in which they should have known this is part of the restoration. That was part of the uh typological fulfillment kind of like isaiah's son uh, is not the born of the virgin yeah it's, it's a near-term yes. confirmation of the prophecy there's a temple but that itself is typological of the yeah the think, temple I, I, absolutely think of it not as the fulfillment of the prophecy but as a restoration of the prophesying right right yeah. so the the first temple is a prophecy a type mm-hmm. of what's to come and then because of the people's sin, yeah. it's destroyed. And we need to, it's not good, honest yet. We've got 400 years to go. Yeah. We need a restoration of the prophesying. Yeah. And Ezekiel's vision here is a vision, I, I, I think it's fair to take it as a, a, a prophecy of the restoration of the prophesying mm-hmm. and also a prophecy of the fulfillment. Right. There we go. All right, well, up next, we got Malachi and then Daniel, and we're going to see some strange things in Daniel as well. So uh, enjoy reading through Ezekiel. Until next time, keep on reading.